lots of snow and cold to um, do something like this, to review some of our plant ID skills and kind of sharpen some of those skills. Uh, Lands uh, pretty much decided which uh, plant groups to focus on here. And I kind of uh, agreed with him, uh, Simple Trichum, the asters are certainly a group that a lot of people I think need some help with usually. Now, of course, with 100 of you or whatever we've got on here, there's gonna be a lot of range and vari variation in kind of what your experience is. So it's gonna be hard to, of course, tailor this to a you know, perfect fit for everybody. But what I tried to do here and we'll do on the rest of them as, as well is to, to really try to uh, provide you with a really good handout uh, that you can use to help teach yourself and use it down the road. That's what we're just kind of gonna go through that in, in the next hour. Uh, because after all, an hour, you know, isn't isn't a whole lot of time to um, to, to cover a, a big complex topic like this. On the one hand, an hour is nice because it's a short amount of time. You're not uh, not doing this for very long. Um, you shouldn't get too bored. I hope. On the other hand, an hour, you know, is is uh, kind of limited in terms of what we want to try and do here. So, so again, I tried to put this handout together, and we'll go through it in a way that can provide you with you know up to date, the most recent you know information about these species uh, that I can that I can can give you and again of course give you some helpful hints on on how to figure out what you've got so simple trichomes uh, let's start with uh, the photo credits down here I want to just you know be up front since we we can't do this in person and we, we and of course we we can't have any live specimens if we were doing a workshop we might have uh, vouchers but since we can't do that we're going to rely on pictures an awful lot and luckily there's a lot of good pictures out there on the web. So the main sources of photos you're gonna see in this um, presentation come from those three sources there. Uh, a few of those are my photographs. Those have the, uh, the border lines around them. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't had the, the time and the, the um, mainly just the time, I guess, to, to really do the photography that needs to be done to really do this right and do all the, the, the close-ups of all the flowers and stuff. Maybe, maybe in the future I'll, I'll be there. Quickly, I want to just review a few things about the, um, now of course we're in the Aster ACE, the family Aster ACE. We're looking at the genus Simpho trichum. Uh, but again, we're going to be uh, looking at a couple more uh, genera, the Solidagos and Helianthus as well. So Aster ACE is going to be a common topic here over the next few weeks. And of course, you should at least have some basic idea of what an inflorescence is like in this family. The, cap, the uh, capitula is plural for capitulum. That's a, a fancy word that just means the head inflorescence, which is an, infl an inflorescence that's uh, tightly packed with dense, small flowers. In fact, the flowers are so small, they call them florets, and they're sessile. They're inserted onto a a receptacle that provides a common place for a large number of flowers to be packed together. And there's four different types of head inflorescences, as you can see here. And I'm not, I'm not going to try to, you know, get into all of this. I don't have time to. Uh, what's important for us tonight, of course, with the um, symphiotrichums, is the radiate head. All of these uh, species in the symphiotrichum have a radiate head, which means that they've got two kinds of flowers. You've got the disc florets, which are bisexual. They occupy the center portion. And they've got the ray florets, which have the, the large um, fused corolla. This is the colorful part of the flower, uh, which are normally just pistillate. In some cases, they're neither sex or they're sterile. All right, so all of the simple trichomes are going to have inflorescences that look essentially like this, except for one species, and we'll get to that. Uh, another important uh, feature of this family, of course, are the involucres. The series of involucral bracts, or you'll see me using the term fillery uh, a lot. These are all of these little scale-like structures that sit down and subtend the, the florets. Uh, they occur at the, at the, just right below where the ray flowers and disc flowers are. All species in the Asteraceae have something like this. And as you can see in these pictures down here, which show a, a one symphil trichum, a lactuca, and a solidago, uh, they can vary a lot in terms of what their form is, what they look like, what those, those individual, again, we'll call them involucral bracts or filaries look like. These are gonna be really important 
uh, generally really important and helpful in identifying symptom trichum. The last overview slide here is the slide looking at the Pappus. Pappus is, is not going to be real important in determining which species of symphyl trichum you have because all symphyl trichums have the same kind of Pappus. It's, it isn't just important to note that this is another important feature. The Pappus is the what, what would be the sepals, would be the calyx if, if the sepals look normal. Uh, so these are these are the, the sepals that make up the calyx, and these are sepals that are highly modified uh, to form um, a variety of structures, as you can see here. And quite often the pappus is involved in the dispersal of the fruits, which are attached at the at the base here. All of the um, species in the central trichum have a pappus that uh, would be described like this: one, mainly just one series of, of bristles. Uh, 60 to 90 of them or so. Uh, one series just means one, one row. Now, I, I put this slide up because I do want you to see and have at your, again, fingertips um, the separation of asters, basically. All of these genera here uh, usually have, uh, go by the common name of aster. We're just going to look at symphyl trichum because, again, we're going to limit it. And this is the most important one. This is by far the one that has the most species in this in the state. But all of these other ones, Eurybia, Ionactus, Dolungara, and Aster, they're still the genus name. Um, these do all occur in the state. And these all were, at least these three, well, all four of these uh, were formerly called asters. but uh, with the new and more recent taxonomy in the floor of North America, and even a little bit before that, um, these are the ones, these are the new genera names. Now. So again, most of the formerly asters are now symphyl trichomes. This just again is a quick table that shows you again how to separate out these, these genera that do include the, uh, the former larger genus aster. So again, for symphyl trichum, it's the, the pappus is important. Uh, symphyl trichums do have, um, some of them have, the, have this characteristic here, have the, the basal leaves that are long petiolate, long, long leaf stems and have a kind of a heart-shaped base to them. Some don't. And then here's a, another diagnostic feature that helps to separate the symphyl trichums from the Eurybias. All right. Um, I'm going to switch over to, to so that you can kind of see again what the handout is. My my uh, my handout is in kind of two parts here. Switching over to uh, this is a word file that has the next part of your handout is kind of again just kind of re reviewing a little bit of of uh, terminology here. I just threw this in quick um, to give you at least some reference on some of the terms that will be be used. Uh, leaf shapes or fillery shapes. Uh, these are the terms we'd use for that. Pubescence terms right here. A few other terms in through here. Uh, and then information about the, uh, what I call the symphial trichum reference table, which is uh, the next five pages here. And what this is, is you can see there's, there's five columns here, five fields. The first column here is the nomenclature according to Florida of North America, what I would consider now the currently uh, recognized and correct scientific name that we should be using. Uh, also in this column, uh, there's some information about the Iowa status. If this is a listed species that is listed as either endangered, threatened, or special concern. And for example, simple trichum boreale is one that's listed as threatened at the state level. And you can see I've got some other information here from the Iowa Natural Areas Inventory Database, uh, how many observations, how many counties, when the last observation was. Uh, I'll also put in this column, because uh, I get lots of requests for this, is the Iowa Coefficient of Conservatism and showing you what the original coefficient was when this first came out in 2000, and now what the revised coefficient is, uh, this is a product of um, work over the last six years by the Floor of Iowa Working Group, uh, which includes me and several others. Uh, and so you'll see what, what's happened to this, if it's changed at all. So for example, again, for this one, 
the coefficient stayed 10. Uh, what we did this second time around though in revision is we've also added another uh, component to the coefficient, a low, medium, or high confidence level. So this tells us again sort of how much confidence the floor of, uh, floor of uh, Iowa Working Group had in our understanding, uh, knowing enough about this species to give it a coefficient that we think you know, is as accurate as we'd like it to be. Uh, usually the, co the um, confidence category here is often low or medium if we simply don't have much information about it. If, if, if none of us are very familiar with the species or there's not very many vouchers in the herbarium, it's really, you know, again, it's very hard then to really know what that coefficient should, should be. The second column here is the uh, nomenclature in Eilers and Rusa, the checklist of plants, which you know is still our only checklist. And then I've also thrown some sort of quick diagnostic features. Uh, we'll be seeing these again in the, in the PowerPoint slides, uh, but this is kind of just to give you again, sort of a, a quick go-to to see, you know, what would be some things to look for to identify it. We also have some synonyms here, of course, that's, that's what this means here. Common names uh, used by others in Rosa and then some other common names that have generally been used. I threw in, you know, some similar species. So these are species that are gonna be likely to confuse it with. General habitat um, description for the species. And then this map that shows the uh, biogeography for the species according to Bonap, uh, which is, you know, um, not perfect, but it's, it's the best, um, probably the best source of information, at least at the county level of what the distributions for these species are. Again, you, you, can, you should be able to take the, the PDF that I sent you, of course, and blow it up and make it bigger if you wanna take a closer look at those. But we can see Borealis just comes into Iowa uh, in the Northern tier of uh, counties. So you got this uh, table. Uh, there's 25 simple trichum species that occur in Iowa. Uh, the ones that are highlighted with shading here are the ones that are the most common and you're going to be most likely to come across. And so these that are shaded are going to be further discussed in the PowerPoint slides that come after this. And these are sort of color coded so that uh, the, the ones that are green shaded, these are mainly forest or woodland species. The ones that are yellow shaded are grassland species or field species, old field species. The ones that are blue shaded are more wetland or wet, really wet music uh, sites type of species. You also see that in some of these, I've got the varieties listed that uh, Flora of North America recognizes. So for example, um, lance leaf aster here, Symphotrichum lanceolatum, there's actually uh, five different varieties. And since all of them have asterisks, all of them are known to occur in Iowa. So the asterisk means that that's a variety that we have uh, in the state. Now, what this means, of course, in a sense, in some ways, is that there's just more unknown about these species, but it also does give you a sense that there's, there's more uh, morphological variation in, that, in those species too, if there's more varieties. All right, so that's a quick overview of this table with again, 25, the 25 symphotrichums. There's I believe three of these species uh, that are in, the, in this column here, which is Eilers and Rosa common, I have new species. So this is, this is a species that was never recognized by Eilers and Rosa because uh, symphotrichum firmum is, is a new species. Uh, it's, it's probably in a sense for us, it's probably a new taxonomic species meaning what's happened here is that um, a variety of Astropenesius has been uh, split out from Astropenesius, uh, the, the general uh, genus has been split out and is now uh, considered to be a separate species. So again, this should be pretty useful for you just to get quick good uh, reference information on all 25 uh, species of Symphotrichum. Uh, the last end here, just a little bit of information about um, hybrids. So one thing about Symphotrichum, of course, and, and probably why you're here is that it is a pretty difficult genus in general. Uh, that's because the, there can be a lot of heteropoly, which means the leaf leaves can vary and do vary quite a bit from the lower basal leaves. So then as you go uh, distally up the plant towards the top, uh, leaf shape, leaf size, leaf, leaf morphology can change quite a bit. 
there's also uh, a lot of a fair amount of variation in the coloration of the ray corollas. Uh, we, we see generally white and blue, but also purplish and various shades of, of lavender, pink. Uh, and again, one particular species can, can vary um, in terms of that a fair amount. There's uh, an awful lot of hybridization that goes on within this genus. There's just, this is the only hybrid recognized by others in Rosa. But there's, there's, if you look in Florida, North America, almost every single species is, is known to hybridize with another species. That, of course, means that that makes things harder because you could be looking at something that could be a result of that and could be combining characteristics, characteristics from two different species. There's also just a lot of basic you know, plasticity uh, and also genetic variation within these species that occurs outside of hybridization. As this, this points out here, sometimes that variation in plasticity and morphology is thought to be caused by hybridization, but it's, but it's not. These are some species that occur right outside of Iowa's borders. They're not known, at least at this point, to occur in Iowa. You can see where they are there, the different states around us, and then there's some references. All right, any qu quick questions there? I don't know if you want to try and take any. <clears throat> All right, uh, then let's jump back to the PowerPoint and um, take a look at um, how to separate these. So what I wanted to do here was take the 18, those, those, there's 18 species that are shaded in that table there. Uh, so these are the ones that are much more likely to, uh, for you to, to, come, to come across. There's a key to the symphotrichums at the end of your handout, or a full-blown, highly technical key, but it's a key just to the symphotrichums in the state. So it's, it's helpful in that it, you know, it's better than using the, the key to uh, symphotrichums of you know, Missouri or to um, Northeastern United States or Michigan, because it's gonna be a key just for the ones that occur in the state. So that's always helpful. It's constructed from a variety of, of, of different keys. But again, uh, at least seven of them, and I'd argue almost eight of them are, you're not, you're not gonna see <laughs> probably. Uh, these are the 18 or 17 that are most likely for you to come across. And again, rather than you know, use the keys, you, you can always go to the keys and, and, and use those and try. I wanted to try to come up with a, something a little bit more uh, useful and practical. So I've separated these 18 symphotrichums into seven different groups based on basic morphology, things you'd recognize when you first uh, look, at the, look at the species of the, the plant. And you can see that there's seven groups. There's actually two group, there's a group one, uh, A1 and A2. So there's two groups that have group A and then uh, B, C, D, E, and F. And so what this is gonna do is it's gonna show, show you how these are split out. So this, this group A are all of the ones that split out because they have, again, these, these long, usually long, pedulate, long uh, leaf stems, at least the lower basal leaves do, have long petioles and the, uh, let me turn on my laser pointer, and the base of the blades are usually cordate or somewhat heart-shaped. There's, there's six species that can show this characteristic. We take those six species and we can split them into three, uh, or two, two, excuse me, two groups, of three species each, you can see them right here again, based on just the serrations. So in looking at the edges, the margins of these leaves, if there's, if there's regular tooth, uh, you no know, teeth along the margin, in other words, regularly serrate or toothed, uh, then it's group A1. If the um, middle leaf margins are more entire, which means that there's no teeth, or if there's just a few very small and widely separated, what we would say remotely tooth, just a few teeth here or there, and then they're gonna go into this group A2. And then you can see the common names of the, of the three species, again, that, that make each of these groups. We'll point out that uh, down here in this group, smooth blue, which is the one that's pictured here, smooth blue aster, is is in this group of you know in the, is in this A group because sometimes sometimes you can see 
uh, lower basal leaves that, that look something like this. But that one is, is the least likely of these six to show this characteristic. And so this smooth blue aster will also key out in another place. It will, it will key out in one of these groups up here as, 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 as well. And this is just an example of a species in like Ontario Asher that doesn't have uh, the, this, this characteristic here. So we're gonna take a look at both group A1 and A2 a little bit more closely here. And these are the characteristics to focus on to separate them. Um, the, first we'll look at the petiole and, and look at how much of a wing there is. So you can see the wing really developed well here on Drummond's Aster. That's what we're talking about here, this, this tissue that looks like a wing along the petiole and also the white arrow leaf. It's a little harder to see here, but this has a wing petiole too. Whereas blue wood aster up here, you can see this does not have much of a wing at all. And so again, this, this can be a difficult one to see, but it is, is probably the best you know, morphological and easiest you know, trait to look for. There's some other things you can use in, in, in the key but that's what separates a blue wood aster out from these other two, is the, the two, these, these two statements here, the, mainly the, the wing. Now, if the wing doesn't, if you have, the, if you have some flowers, because um, this wing petiole can be pretty, uh, you know, it can be hard to determine what, you, what you've got there. There could be variation in it. Probably a better trade if you've got flowers is to look at the involucres. So look at these bracts here. You can see here that what it says up here is the, uh, the fillery is merely acute, sometimes with a small mucro, which means just a small slender point. You can kind of see a couple of small slender points on some of these here. But look at the shape of these, these involucral bracts or fillories compared to these down here. Uh, these down here, the, the fillaries are much longer and more narrow and have a more accumulate or attenuate uh, tip as it's called, uh, just longer and slender. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty distinct difference uh, between again, and both of these are gonna have that type of uh, bract compared to the bracts you see here. Once you get uh, blue wood aster off here, then uh, separating white arrow leaf aster, uh, which is uh, Symphotrichum urophilum from Symphotrichum drummondii, Drummond's aster, right here, these two, it, that's really morphologically, it's, it's the, the amount of pubescence on the stems uh, and the uh, color of the, of the rays. So again, we see white, almost always white, or maybe pale lavender at, at the best, uh, color in the, in the ray corollas over here. And we see mainly bright blue to purple or lavender over here. So if they're in flower, you, you can easily uh, separate them on that basis. If they're not in flower, again, it's, to, it's the pubescence. Drummond's has lots of aster, or excuse me, has lots of pubescence on, on the stems. Whereas uh, white arrow leaf, you can kind of see this stem right here. If you uh, blow that up a little bit, um, they're, they're mostly glabrous, stems glabrous, or as it says, sparsely harrow. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Uh, anyway, sparsely hairy in vertical bands, which means this narrow vertical uh, rows. All right, then if we look at A2, um, these are the ones that have, again, the heart-shaped uh, bases, again, generally have um, a long petiole, but the leaf margins are entire. Uh, what we're gonna see here is we're gonna separate smooth blue aster off first, because this, again, is the one that that is the, the least uh, likely to have actually those, those basal leaves that are, are, are like that. And so this is one that I'm sure you, many of you have seen. It's a real common prairie species uh, in music to even somewhat dry, dry music prairie. Uh, probably the best thing is again, to look at those leaves and see again, this, this, these sessile leaves, that means there's no leaf stem and they're somewhat clasping, meaning that the bases of these leaves kind of wrap around, there's a really small oracles here, uh, which are a term meaning little lobes. So there's little lobes on the, on the bottoms of these leaves that kind of uh, wrap around and somewhat clasp and in a sense, the, the uh, stem. Also, everything is glabrous. Uh, there's very little, any kind of hairiness. And um, when you see this plus minus that, that's my way of saying more or less, 
uh, more or less glaucous. That means this is a term that's defined in, in the glossary, but it means that there's sort of a bluish, a kind of a bluish green or a pale grayish or whitish sort of waxy surface layer, uh, which is again kind of makes it a little shiny. That, so, so smooth blue will separate off pretty easily. You can see that there's also some uh, between uh, smooth blue and shorts. We're going to be talking about this in just a bit. There is some difference in these uh, bracts as well. But when we look at the other two, sky blue aster, that's again one that's going to be in prairies versus shorts aster. This is going to be in forests. So you're probably not going to, uh, you can pretty much again separate them on the basis of that for the most part. But uh, if you had to look at it more morphologically, um, the uh, characteristics you're seeing here would work. The uh, sky blue is mainly the leaves that are chordate or heart shaped are mainly or only the lower ones. As you go up the stem on sky blue aster, the, the mid colleen and upper leaves uh, do not have that chordate, that heart shaped base that you see down here. Whereas in, in shorts, that, that heart shapedness continues up uh, quite a ways up. Finally, towards the very top of the plant, um, those leaves are not likely to be heart-shaped and they're more likely to be uh, sessile. Uh, but, um, and also these, these leaves on shorts aster are really uh, large lancelet shaped, really strongly lance shaped leaves, uh, up to six inches long, two inches wide or so. Whereas again, the, the leaves on uh, sky blue aster aren't that large and aren't that strongly lance shaped as you can kind of see here. They're more of a, an, an elliptic shape. Also sky blue aster has got a really a lot of, of scabrous uh, pubescence on the leaf surface. So it really feels like sandpaper if you rub your fingers on, on the surface of that leaf. Uh, you can see some other differences here with the filaries too. And one of them is this one, which is really helpful. If you do have the have flowers, the filaries are glabrous here. So there's no hairs on any of these. Whereas in, on shorts, the filaries, as you can see in this picture here, have pubescence. There's def definitely uh, hairs on the backs of, of those uh, bracts there. All right, uh, two done, five to go. Uh, so now we're gonna, jump into the groups no B, C, D, E, and F. And I'm going to separate off three more species. So most of these groups have just three, two to three species. Now we're going to separate off three more species uh, from the rest of the group is group B on the basis of just really two really very easy, very, very easy diagnostic features. Uh, these species have at least uh, one or the other of these two things right here, either uh, the leaves and the filaries have this real dense pubescence of sort of a press, which means they're, they're laying down flat against the, the leaf surface or the bract, very uh, silky looking, provides a very silvery, you know, silky uh, looking uh, surface to the leaves and, and to, to the bracts. That's silky aster, again, one that I'm sure many of you have seen. Uh, that's, this is probably the most easy aster to identify. Uh, based on just the um, the other um, characteristic, that again, super, these two distinctive features is whether there's um, stipitate glandular pubescence. So these are these would be little hairs that have little glands, little spherical glands at the tops of those hairs, stipitate gland glandular. And so uh, generally, the the involucre for sure has these in both of these species. Um, the stalk, that, that refers to the stalk of, of the head in, in, in fluorescence. Uh, and in um, aromatic aster over here, which is again, the two species there are New England and aromatic. In um, aromatic aster, even the upper leaves and the upper portions of the stems of the plants have these, have these uh, st stipitate glandular hairs. So again, just on the basis of, of these two distinctive features, we've got these three species, silky comes off because it's got the, uh, the silky hairs, the pressed hairs. The other two come off because of the stipitate glands. And again, the New England and aromatic uh, can be separated on the basis of the leaves, 
New England has um, auriculate clasping leaves, again, meaning that the base of these leaves have little oracles or little leaf lobes that wrap around the, the stem a little bit, uh, whereas aromatic does not have that at all. Uh, aromatic has, has uh, smaller leaves in general, a little more oblong shape. And again, there's a big difference in where you find these. You know, New England's going to be in wet music uh, types of sites, um, usually more open, somewhat sunny. They can be somewhat shaded. Whereas uh, aromatic is really a dry, dry grassland, dry, dry prairie type of species. Um, what were the Latin names for those ones? Okay, so this one is Symptotrichum cerisium. Uh, New England is Symptotrichum novae angliae, and aromatic aster is Symptotrichum oblongifolium. All right, now we're going to separate off uh, group C. So these then going, you know, again, going back to what this says, you know, no dense silky pubescence, no stipitate glandular pubescence. Uh, we're going to, we're going to focus on that. And we're going to separate off um, three more species here on the basis of the basis of the leaves. Uh, most leaves in group C here, these three species, as it says here, except basal and sometimes loremost leaves, have a strong or moderately auriculate clasping leaf base. Again, the same thing that you see in New England aster. That same thing you see there. Have, have oracles that, that tend to, to some degree, it can be weakly or strongly. So the amount of that can vary a bit, uh, but, but pretty easy to recognize have, have that type of clasping. And here you're getting to see is this is where smooth blue aster comes out again because uh, it does have that. So again, in, in not, not every uh, smooth blue aster plant is going to have the, the long uh, petioled heart-shaped basal leaves that we uh, use to separate off group A. So again, that's why this species can, can come out at two different places here. Uh, the other two, uh, crooked stem aster, which is uh, Symptotrichum uh, prenantoides, and swamp aster, which is Symptotrichum panisium, uh, come out in this group because, again, of, of these uh, auriculate clasping leaf bases. <clears throat> and you can see that these are really easy to separate. They're both going to be in kind of the same kind of habitat. They're going to be in kind of wet, wet places, damp places. But uh, crooked stem is really, really has very distinctive leaves. Uh, the leaves are coarsely serrate. You can see the teeth here, very large, recognizable teeth. The, the, the shape of the leaf itself is, is, is lanceolate. It has this taper right here about at the middle. So it's tapered below the middle into a broadly winged petiole. That's what this is right here, really broadly winged petiole. And then the base of it is strongly strongly auriculate clasping. It gets its name, crooked stem aster, because the stem often has sort of a zigzag look to it. This is gonna grow in, in um, a place I've seen it most often is usually sort of in riparian areas, damp places along streams, um, in, in forest environments, in, in wet soil areas, uh, damp soils there, usually, usually somewhat sh shaded. Um, swamp aster is more likely to be a bit more open. Um, so again, its, its leaves look more like this uh, over here, um, lanceolate to elliptic, tapering to just more of a sessile base. They're not as strongly auriculate clasping. So of the three species, uh, swamp is probably got the weakest uh, type of, of clasping. But it, it's recognizable in some other features. It often has a reddish stem, uh, it's sometimes called red stem aster usually has quite a bit of uh, pubescence on that red stem. Um, the leaves look somewhat a little bit like lance-leafed aster, if you know what that species um, looks like. We're going to come to it in just a bit. All right, well, I think we're staying on schedule. We've got about 20 minutes left here. We've got uh, three more groups to look at. So group D, now we're going to separate group D off. And this one is a little bit harder to, to consolidate. Um, You'll, you'll see that you know if you look at the key at the very end, uh, uh, many of what you know many of the 
characteristics, of course, in here come from the key. I tried to focus on the more useful ones. Um, it was kind of hard to pull this group together. I wanted to get these three together. And basically what I came up was with this separation here, basically. These all are white flowered and they're typically found in, I would say more or less dry grasslands, but uh, certainly heath aster, Symphotrichum ericoides, and hairy aster, Symphotrichum pilosum, uh, can be uh, found in somewhat more you know, mesic sites at least, maybe even approaching a little bit damp, but, but almost always definitely uh, an open environment, a sunny environment, open woodland, uh, more barren kinds of areas. Uh, and I would also say to some extent, uh, all three of these, uh, a little bit more of a, a species that responds well to disturbance as well. Uh, so uh, through road, roadsides in there as well. Whereas um, groups E and F over here, they separate off then because, well, they can be white or they can be blue or purple flowered. So blue and purple, of course, separates these then from these. Uh, but if they're white, the white ones over here are typically much more mesic. They're going to be in, in wet mesic forests, they're going to be in really damp uh, type of grassland environment. So uh, much more likely to be in a, a, definitely a wetter type of environment uh, than what these are here. These three can be uh, a little bit difficult. Um, and, and I'll point out right away that this one right here, small white aster, symphotrichum parviceps, uh, this is one that's not really well um, known, I would say, in the state. Uh, it is mostly, I think, a southeastern. I'm looking at my other maps over here real quick. Uh, well, it's, its distribution, I was mainly kind of towards the south and eastern portion of the state. It also occurs mainly in Missouri and western Illinois, goes down into um, southeastern Kansas some. I've only seen this, I think, uh, and it was a vegetative uh, specimen, I think, so I wasn't 100% sure. Um, it may be just a couple places. So it's, it's probably not one that you're going to run across, but I put it in because we need, we need to be aware of it, and it would be nice to know if, uh, if it is out there more. It's just been um, overlooked. So the way that these three separate out is mainly looking at, first of all, the fillaries here. These two species down here, the small white and the hairy aster, they're, they're characterized by this characteristic right here. And you look at the fillaries, which again, these into Lucre bracts here. And this picture here from Minnesota wildflowers kind of probably is the best that I've seen online to show this. Again, I, I could take a picture myself if I ever get the chance, but um, the, what this means is that the, the, as you get out towards the ends of these into Lucre bracts, these fillaries, the, uh, the bract becomes, the, the margins of that bract roll over towards the upper surface. They get enrolled towards the tip, which is no way of saying that is that they're in, uh, involute towards the tip. That makes then the tip somewhat tubular because uh, you've got a flat surface that is rolling over uh, the top, the, the edges are rolling over kind of like that and it forms somewhat of a tube. You keep going out that that tip will uh, it will form a, a you know a pointed tip and quite often there will be a, a minute sort of bristle like point as it says here a minute spine at, at the very tip so it, it's, it's these bracts that are roll the, the edges of them are rolling over uh, as you go towards the tip that's that's what you have to look for and that's going to be the characteristic that that pulls uh, hairy aster, symphotrichum pilosum, and small white aster, uh, parviceps, separates that from heath aster. Heath aster has very distinctive involucra bracts. Uh, and, and again, it's worth pointing out that they're not enrolled, of course, in at the tip. They are short, I would say short lancelet and somewhat thickened at the base at least. They taper very quickly and they're somewhat recurved. You can see here, these are curving, curving back. Uh, they're somewhat recurved, and they almost always end in a very sharp, stiff, pointed spine. And again, this picture doesn't quite show them as well as I like. I need to take a picture of that too, but um, uh, if you look at this with a hand lens, you can easily see that. 
And so again, the, the very, very big difference between the, uh, the, the bracts here. Now, Heath Aster is one that, again, is, I think, easy to separate from uh, Harry Aster, basically just on the size as well. So it's a much smaller plant. The leaves are much smaller uh, and more um, linear, uh, whereas these have more of a, an elliptic shape to them and much larger. Both of them can be fairly hairy, but, but this is a lot, uh, a hairy aster, pilosum is just a lot larger, a very branchy plant, has, has you know, lots of branches. Uh, both of them produce a lot of flowers, but the, um, the flowers on heath aster are, are much smaller than the, the flowers on hairy. And here's a good characteristic vegetatively. I've seen hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of, of uh, plants. And I've always noticed that the leaves on Heath Anster tend to be slightly falcate. You can see in this one right here, and to some extent this one too. Falcate means slightly uh, sickle shaped or slightly curved. All right. Um, yeah. This, I have a question. This is Dawn. Um, in the bottom photo of three of the hairy, the arrow um, on the right side, what is, what, there's the words cut oh, off there. What yeah, is that? Uh, that is pointing to the same thing as this, a minute spine. So there's a little tiny spine right there, right above my laser pointer. And what it's saying is that's, uh, not, it's saying the same thing as you see right here, a mi minute spine, minute spine at the tip. And then, yeah, yeah, this one's saying the edges are rolled under. You can kind of see that a little bit here. It's, you really can't see the rolling, I guess, but you can kind of see how the tip kind of narrows down a little bit. And it's narrowing down because the edges are, are rolling. All right, got two more groups. Um, group E. Now, so again, what we're doing now is we're, we're taking, again, this group right here, and we're going to separate them and uh, separate these into two groups of two species. And that, that finishes us there again for the 18 more common species. This is, this is um, the characteristic used by all the keys. All the keys use the same one. It's not the most handy one because it's, it's a difficult one to sometimes see. Um, group E here uh, separates off from um, F on the basis of the disc corollas. Now, these two groups are pretty easy to recognize vegetatively too, but um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you again what we're talking about here with both uh, side flowering aster, which is uh, Symphotrichum latiflorum, and Ontario aster, which is uh, Symphotrichum ontarianus. What this is saying here is that the disc corollas, and again, the disc corollas are the, are the corollas of the disc florets right in the center, not the ray florets. The, the, smaller tubular disc florets right in the center. So you, you pretty much have to have a, a scope to really see this. And then you might be able to see it with the hand lens, but it'd be kind of hard. What this is saying is we're gonna look at those disc corollas and it says here 45 to 75% of the total length of the expanded upper portion of the corolla uh, is occupied by the corolla lobes. In other words, the lobes of the disc corollas comprise more than half of the limb. That's another way that, that they often say it. And this, just to oppose that over here, this group is it's only 15 to 45%. The disc corollas are much shorter. You can see the actual comparison in, in length here, those, those two values there, though there, there is some overlap, of course, but less than 50%, as you can see here, of the total length of that same upper portion, which what's called the limb, is occupied or made up by the the uh, corolla lobes. So to visualize this, I'm going to jump ahead. And, and so this is a slide just to try, try to help you see what we're talking about here. Um, the term limb, unfortunately, has um, different definitions in different places. Uh, this is a real common way of thinking about the limb. Here again is a flower that uh, represents fused petals. And this is, this is why I teach it in field botany. When you have a sympetalous corolla or a fused corolla, petals are fused together, you generally see these three parts, the tube, which is really slender, narrow tubular portion, the throat, which is the portion of the, the fused corolla that's expanding, and then the limb, which are the corolla lobes, the, the unfused portion of each petal. And 
again, that's kind of what this diagram is showing here. So the sort of the conventional way of thinking about limb is just to say, well, the limb is just simply saying limb is equal to the corolla lobes. That's what this is saying here. However, the keys utilize the same approach that FNA, the floor of North America does in describing what the limb is. Here's, here's a, a flower, here's a disc floret pulled apart. So you can see what, actually what a disc floret would look like if you did this. You pulled one out and you uh, dissected it to pull the corolla apart. Here's what it looks like intact. We take a scalpel and cut this down and pull those um, edges back to reveal the inside of this corolla tube we would see that the stamens are fused uh, and attached to the inside of this corolla tube right at the top of the tube, right at the top of the tube. And so the way that FNA utilizes the term limb, they use the term limb for everything from where these stamens are attached at their bases up, which means then the limb is represents the throat and the corolla lobes in FNA and in almost every other key because every other key utilizes the same approach. So for example, in this little example here, the corolla lobes are this much of the limb because that's they're just the unfused portion of petals and the blue represents the throat. And so I measured this with a ruler. And so in this case, the lobes comprise 23% of the limb. The distance of this, di this distance right here of this pink arrow is 23% of the total distance of the blue and pink, which is the, the limb. So that's what they're talking about here. And uh, that's then what you, know, you try, to try to figure out and see. You could probably just look at this with a hand lens and get a rough idea of whether it's uh, over 50 or less than 50. But if it's over 50, then again, you're gonna go this direction. And then these two are easy to separate just on the basis of vegetative morphology. Uh, you just simply look at the ventral surface of the leaves. Ontario aster has pubescence that goes all the way across the leaves. Um, so there's pubescence on the veins and in the areoles, the little, the, the little areas of non-vascularized uh, tissue. So you can see the pubescence going all the way across, whereas south side flowered aster has pubescence just on the mid vein. Uh, these, do, these two both grow in forest. They look somewhat similar vegetatively. Um, I, it's easy for me to recognize that I'm looking at either one of these two vegetatively. Here you can kind of see what these leaves look like. Here you can kind of see what these leaves look like. So sort of a gestalt wise, I do have a similar look to them. I always just grab a leaf, look at the undersurface, and I can see again which one I've got, uh, presuming that again, it's, it's one of these two, which is probably gonna be the case again, if you're in a, a forest or shaded type of environment. All right, so the last group then, group F, are the ones that have the, the uh, this corollas occupy less than 50% of, of the limb. And that's going to be uh, these two species, uh, willow aster and lance leaf aster. Again, again, we're just looking at, again, just the 18 most common ones. And so the, these two, again, will grow in some, somewhat similar environments, uh, usually damp. Um, lance leaf can grow in probably a little bit more damp types of environments. Um, what we see is the, the difference here. There's quite a bit in through here, but the, the, probably the easiest thing is vegetative. You look at uh, the undersurface of the leaves. Excuse me, the leaves are going to be very similar in terms of their shape. And they're going to be sort of a, a lance or elliptic uh, type of shape like, like this. But look at this. So on the undersurface of willow aster, uh, what this is saying here, the leaves beneath with a distinct regular reticulate pattern formed by dark prominent veinlets. So these little veinlets are really um, conspicuous and again, form these uh, what are called isodiametric little spaces of tissue. Isodiametric means approximately equal uh, size um, sides. All of the sides are about the same size, roughly. And you can kind of generally see that pattern. So this is just a very strong um, reticulate, you know, uh, pattern 
um, formed by these veins uh, when you look at the uh, ventral surface of these leaves. If you hold this up to the light, you know, if you get some sunlight, hold it up to the light, you'll probably be able to see that better. Um, what else do we have here? Um, so the ray corollas are purple or bluish, very rarely white. So that's useful for willow aster again. They can be sort of a, a pale lavender, pale bluish, you know, starting to look a little bit more whitish. Um, but generally the ray crawlers are going to be helpful as well because on lance leaf aster, the rays are almost always white, less commonly bluish tinged or lavender. Uh, this is the one that's by far the most common that you're going to see in um, lots of environments that are, are damp, uh, even wet uh, pasture lands or prairies. Um, willow aster is probably a little bit more conservative, but I tend to see a little bit more in the southern part of the state. All right, that's it. I guess we have about five minutes for questions, if there are some. That's a quick overview, hopefully a review for some of you, hopefully some more material for you to study and, and uh, help teach yourself more about these plants. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat, but if anybody has okay. any, either type them in there or um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Uh, does this allow me to talk? I yeah, can hear this, this is the first time I've used this. I don't know what I'm doing, really. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like you to, it, I came in a little late. I'm probably asking you to repeat something, but would you tell me what you think are the most common, maybe four or five asters? In the, okay, yeah, uh, the four, most common four or five. Let's go uh, back to that list uh, real quick, that table. Um, oh shoot, I have, to, I have to open that up again quick here. I'm just going to put this down and then uh, open that up real quick. Yep. All right, so uh, let's go through this list and pick out the top five. I would say probably uh, this one right here would be the top five uh, quarterfolium, common blue wood aster. This one used to be known in, it's known in Islands and Rosa and used to be known as Aster sagittifolius or arrow leaf aster. Uh, and so we used to have two, two species that were separated out, sagittifolius and quarterfolius. And uh, Florida, North America combined them together and said, these are just two uh, versions <laughs> of the same species. So it's now a simple track of quarterfolium. This is a real pretty common one you're gonna find in, in, in uh, forested environments or shaded types of environments. You can see it occurs almost entire throughout the entire state. So this would be in the top five. Uh, definitely heath aster. You can see that there everywhere in Iowa, uh, a real common one in, any, uh, in de any kind of prairie, good prairies, a little bit more degraded prairies, even some pasture lands, uh, pasture prairies as well. I would say in the top five. Uh, I would probably go with uh, Lanceolatum here again, lance leaf aster. Um, it is again, pretty common uh, in any kind of wet, <laughs> damper environment. Again, and, and so the ones that are gonna be most common, of course, the, well, those are gonna be a little bit more, uh, less conservative because they, by being less conservative, this one is a four as compared to uh, smooth blue here, which is an eight. So, you know, I'd like to say this would be a real common one, but you got to be on a prairie probably to see this one. In Lance Leaf Aster, you don't have to be on a prairie. I mean, you can be in other sort of more disturbed types of um, places. Of the, of the two, um, these two here that are forest ones, uh, side flower and Ontario, Ontario is more common uh, for sure. And so I, I would pick this one as well as in the top five. And um, also in the top five, of course, would have to be this one right here, Aster pilosus, or excuse me, Cyphotrichum pilosum, uh, hairy. Uh, because this, this is another weedy one. You know, it, it, it was a zero in the old system. And we, we uh, one of our policies in the new uh, coefficients was no native species was going to have zero. I was insistent on that. And so uh, it is bumped up to a one. 
So those would be your top five, I guess. I would say Cipotrichum uh, pilosum, Ontario ness. Um, well, if I just had limited to five, Lanceolatum, Ericoides, and uh, Cordifolium. But some, some close seconds would be New, New England Aster, probably. It would be pretty common, too. I mean, it's pretty common on plantings. Um, yeah, I'd say the, the, these other ones are going to be not as, as easy to find. Good question. Am I still able to talk? Yeah. <laughs> um, I've seen uh, big, vast fields of of a white aster. Is that probably a heath aster? Probably frost aster or hairy. It's probably or hairy. Probably this one, um, Symphotrichum pilosum. If it's, is it pretty tall? Um, pretty tall. Around. Uh, Maybe not waist high, but between knee and yeah, waist high. Probably this one, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there could be some heath aster. Heath aster, as you can see here, is um, a little bit more conservative. It's it's got a coefficient of five, whereas um, again, hairy aster one. <laughs> that means this is a lot more weedy, and uh, you're just going to see it a lot more places. Uh, it's real common in, in old, old fields, roadsides, disturbed areas, any place where humans have, have messed things up. Um, heath aster is, is you know, not quite that weedy. Okay, thank you. Sure. Tom? Yes. Um, I believe I've seen a fair amount of uh, Latera florum, especially in plantings, in intentional plantings in roadsides. Does that really? match what you've seen? Yes. Uh, I know I haven't looked at a lot of roadside plantings. Um, it probably wouldn't be the best species to put in there. Latera florum, huh? Huh. Yeah. We're um, talking about roadsides out in sunny open conditions. Yes. I don't always key it out, but sometimes when I have that, that's what it keys out as. Hmm. Now I've looked at a couple of seed lists for the IRVM, and I think I've seen Latera florum in there. Well, it could be, I guess. I mean, that's that's the thing about plantings, you know, you can <laughs> whatever you you want, and and it, it, again, what there's always a possibility of things getting in there accidentally if if things are misidentified by growers and seed suppliers. Uh, I can't say that I've run across it really in any prairie reconstructions. Okay. I've really only seen it in places where it's generally supposed to be. Yeah, in fairly wooded areas. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And as you can see here, mainly in the eastern half of the state. Yeah. <clears throat> in that little map there. Yeah. Can't say that I've seen it out west, but definitely central and east. Well, uh, I'll have to look more closely. Uh, well, maybe I'm missing closely. something. Uh, yeah, if you don't have the flowers, you know, then it's a little bit harder. Yeah. Um, but this is with the flowers. Always, uh, collect the, always, I mean, if you want to collect a specimen and, and send it to me, you know, just put it in a plastic bag and mail it or drop it off or something. Okay. Keep that in mind. Thanks. Well, all right, hopefully uh, this was worth your time to get caught up a little bit on uh, symphotrichums. Um, next week, we're going to tackle those solid eagles. Okay. Thanks for your uh, attention. Have a good Thank week. you. You're welcome. Thanks, Thank Tom. you. Good to see everybody.